Uh, Neil, this is your first time presenting at the, uh, the BSAC Library Conference. How did you feel about the event? Oh, I've enjoyed it greatly. Anytime you can have a room full of people, more than 300 people, uh, it gives you a fantastic opportunity for outreach. And when you're reaching leaders in the community who can spread the word down through the community, fantastic. If, uh, if divers wanted to go away and sort of work on practice that might influence uh, decompression stress for them, but they don't have access to one of your nice fancy heart monitors, what sort of thing would you recommend them to do? Well, you, if you recognize the various factors that can influence your stress, if you make tiny incremental changes in the right direction on each of them, or many of them, you don't have to do a lot of monitoring, you can protect yourself. So if you're a little bit smarter about when you do your stops, a little bit smarter with ascent rate, careful on the timing and intensity of exercise, you can control the risk without the direct monitoring. So speaking on, on that exercise aspect, you said in your talk about uh, 24 hours beforehand, you should maybe do a little bit of high intensity training. What sort of thing would you recommend to do? Because I imagine it's probably not much American. No, the research that was done that showed a protective effect of exercise 24 hours before was running activity, but it wouldn't be a marathon. If you were running um, a 5K distance, for example, that would certainly be similar to the stressor. There is no magic bullet. There's no one exercise that is going to be perfect. We just have some evidence that exercise 24 hours before a dive seems to have some bioprotection. So, um, so you were talking about um, how computers have you know, made diving, one of a better phrase, you know, easier in terms of what sort of stops people need to do and, and calculate and that sort of thing. What's your opinion on sort of teaching uh, novices tables versus computers versus anything else? I believe that the concepts of dive tables are important to teach. But really, a dive table is just a single compartment computer model. But I think it's still important to show how the tables work because then when people conceptually get it, you can move to dive computers and it can make sense. So really, the dive tables are an example. Cool. And so um, if people, because nowadays, you know, also most computers, you can download information off them, you can look at your profiles, and um, people can maybe look at that and think, how do I feel after a dive like that? Is there anywhere that perhaps people can upload information to, to help guys like you that are researchers that need that sort of information? And, Yes, for actually almost 15 years, we had something going called Project Dive Exploration, and we were collecting dive profiles and outcomes to get a handle over uh, on, on what profiles might be causing problems. Dan Europe is actually doing some of the same work. So yes, there are avenues, portals right now for people to download their logs. There's a challenge with that. We collected almost 400,000 computer logs, but if you have a conservative profile, it doesn't actually give you that much information because you don't know if you're close to the edge or far away from the edge. And so we've actually stopped actively collecting the project dive exploration, but people can still use it on an individual basis. You can try to submit to Dan Europe um, or hold on if there are new initiatives. I mean, the biggest reason to collect it is when you have the bad outcome day. When you have a bad outcome that ends in a decompression sickness hit, that's when for sure we would like that dive profile information. Cool. So you've done some uh, really interesting stuff in the, sort of your career with dive medicine and stuff like that. Do you have any advice that you might give to, to young people that would you know, like to follow in your footsteps? Yeah, the biggest thing you have to do is say yes to opportunity and do a good job and each opportunity leads to the next opportunity. So. A lot of times those first opportunities don't look quite as appealing as they might, and they almost always involve more work than you would expect. But if you say yes, do well, you can build a career out of that. Um, just going back to your talk quickly, you spoke about how mammals, um, so that, that dive like seals or whatever, may well suffer from, from DCS, um, and they obviously don't have access to a nice treatment chain. Um, is there many studies on uh, how animals sort of deal with decompression stress? Well, there are a number of studies if you put the world of science together. The paper that I showed in my presentation was a good example. Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution received a grant to try to assess the question of marine mammal um, decompression stress from the point of view of were Navy sonar units affecting their behavior and creating risk. And so what they did is they pulled together people from a variety of different expertise areas and brought us together at Woods Hole for a four-day workshop. And the idea was simple. You bring in people who had different expertise, so when you got to a point where your knowledge, your expert knowledge ran out, somebody else could hopefully pick it up. 
and they basically closed the door, locked them for four days, and said we weren't allowed to come out until we came to some resolution. And it was really powerful. We had engineers, we had physiologists, biologists, people with different skill sets that were able to address questions. We would get to a point where we didn't know what the marine mammals would do, but a marine mammologist would say, well, no, actually, wait a second. We do know that from our research. And we were able to see that the marine mammals are doing, essentially, decompression stops. Some of the deep divers come up, they do a shallow hold before they hit the surface. It's beautiful, and we would have never seen that if we didn't have a bunch of different experts in the room. So, it's obviously, as I said, it's the first time at the, the VTAC Diving Conference, but you, you've been to the UK before, you've presented plenty of times in various places. Um, is there any dive sites in the UK that you're particularly interested in that you might not have been to before or have been to before? Oh, well, there are so many that I haven't been to. Uh, the last dive site I dived in the UK was Stony Cove, which was good fun because it was December and we were trying to look at the impact of an undergarment. So we went in and flooded dry suits and swam around for an hour. So that was my last dive in the UK. So I think it's about time that I did something a little bit more attractive. <laughs> no, no, you know, science is good. <laughs> I think that's probably about it. Thank you very much. All right. It's been a pleasure.